This morning we're in um, Mark 13. And again, what I'd like to do in beginning is just simply read the entire chapter to give you an idea of what it is that we're looking at. This Usually when you're going through the Bible and, and uh, preparing sermons, you, you want to uh, take a complete thought and deal with you know, one whole thought, one whole story. You, know, you wouldn't take the parable of the Good Samaritan perhaps and chop it up into ten sermons, although you could do that, or you could just treat the whole thing at one time. Well, this happens to be a rather lengthy passage, all dealing with one topic, so I don't want to try to attempt to deal with it all this morning, but rather to set the context as to what it is that Jesus is speaking about here, which I've already told you, and why it is we believe that, who the audience is that this is directed toward. But of course, we also want to see as we go through this how it still has application for us today. But let's begin by reading the text so that we know what we're talking about and realizing there are these differences of opinions. Uh, you need to know or you need to be convinced in your own mind what it is that Jesus is talking about in order that you may apply it because this text has been seriously misapplied and it has affected a lot of people in a, in a bad way. So uh, let's, let's read it. Let's see what it is our Lord is talking about. So Mark chapter 13 beginning in verse 1. And as he was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Jesus said to him, Do you not see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another, which will not be torn down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew were questioning him privately. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? And Jesus began to say to them, See to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will mislead many. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. Those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. And when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not be anxious beforehand about what you are to say. But say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak but it is the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother to death and a father his child. And children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all on account of my name. But the one who endures to the end, he shall be saved. When you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And let him who is on the housetop not go down or enter in to get anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are with child and to those who nurse babes in those days. But pray that it may not happen in the winter. For those days will be a time of tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never shall. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or behold, he is there, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show signs and wonders in order, if possible, to lead the elect astray. But take heed, behold, I have told you everything in advance. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven. And the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send forth the angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the furthest end of the earth to the furthest end of heaven. Now learn the parable from the, from the fig tree. When its branches have already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. 
Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Take heed, keep on the alert, for you do not know when the appointed time is. It is like a man away on a journey, who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, cock crowing, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now again, we're just going to break ground on this passage. Obviously, we can't deal with all these details in, in one sermon, but what we're going to look at is the context. Now again, let's back up and consider the context of well, the larger context in which Jesus is actually saying this. Remember, I already told you that it is the last week of his life. He's already presented himself to Jerusalem as her king as he comes riding in on the donkey. And many of the Jews seem to acknowledge that he was king, laying the palm branches in his path and crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Now, as the week progresses, he showed them further his authority as king and his zeal for his father's glory by going into the temple and cleansing the temple of all the merchandising. Again, exercising that authority that the king. And they asked him, you know, by what authority do you, do, do you do these things? Because only one who has authority over the temple can do this. The scribes, the Pharisees, or actually it's more like the Sadducees uh, and the Herodians seem to have authority over the temple. But Jesus exercises his authority as king. He further showed them his kingly wisdom by answering all of their questions that were meant to trip him up and by asking a few questions of his own which were really meant to show them who he was. Again, that he was their Messiah. Now, in every way, we might say, through the fulfillment of prophecy, and through his teachings, and through his miracles, he has proven himself to be their Messiah, and yet they refused to accept that fact and to accept him. And so Jesus takes up the subject again that he actually has brought up a couple of times that has to do with the outcome of all of this, and that is judgment upon Israel. Remember, he began to deal with this topic when he cursed the fig tree. No longer shall there be any fruit upon you, and immediately the fig tree withered. We don't believe that Jesus did that just to curse a fig tree, but he did that as a symbol of what was going to happen to Israel. I've come to you year after year looking for fruit on you, and I have found none. Because of that, you no longer can take up even the space of ground that you're occupying. May no one eat fruit from you any longer from now on. And, of course, the fig tree withered. Jesus took up the topic again in the parable of the vineyard, which I've already described to you. The, the vineyard was basically God's kingdom. It was given to the vine growers, and that's Israel. And every year, the, the, the owner of the vineyard would send his servants to get the produce of the vineyard, and each year they would be rejected and beaten and sent away, and finally he sends his son, and they say, here's the heir, let's kill him, throw him out of the vineyard, and the vineyard will belong to us. And of course, that's what they did to the Son of God. And Jesus tells them what the Again, the owner of the vineyard is going to do to them. He's going to bring those wretches to a wretched end, and he's going to give the vineyard out to others who will produce its fruits. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is going to be taken away from you and given to a nation that will produce its fruit. And the idea, again, of the stumbling. If you fall upon this rock, you'll be broken. But if it falls upon you, it will grind you into powder. But that's exactly what the Lord is telling them is going to happen to them because they have rejected him. This is really going to be the beginning of the fulfillment of the promise that the Father has made to Jesus Christ. Remember in one of the questions, he asked them, if Messiah is the son of David, why does David call him Lord? 
And it comes from that passage in Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. We just read in Psalm 2 that if the kings and the leaders of the nations don't submit to the Lord, he may become angry and they would perish in the way. But that's exactly what is going to happen to Israel. So the promise of the Father to subdue all of his enemies under his feet is going to begin with the nation of Israel. So Jesus begins to deal with that topic. Now, as you know, again, this is a very large topic. It's going to take a few Lord's Days to deal with. So this morning, we're going to look at just one thing, and that is, what is it that Jesus is talking about here? And the reason why I have to labor it, again, is because of all the uh, misunderstanding in this passage, all the misinterpretations, which do, as a matter of fact, have a profound impact on our lives. If you happen to be a part of one of those churches that looks at this text and believes its fulfillment is yet future, it, um, it can really change the way you live. At one point, I think I might have mentioned before in another context, we were literally wanting to get on our roofs and just do nothing, waiting for the return of Christ. But that is not what this text is teaching us. So again, there's a variety of views on these passages and the parallel passages that deal with this subject. And we can really divide them up, I think, into three camps. Those who see the fulfillment of what Jesus is referring to here in Mark 13 in parallel passage as being primarily future, actually almost entirely future, from our perspective. Now, we know it was future from their perspective, but from our perspective is a different question. Has it happened yet or has it not yet happened? Many people today, many Christians believe that it's still future. There are those who see things dealing with the past and with the future who would divide it up and who say that at some point Jesus goes from speaking to one to speaking about the other. And then there are those who see it primarily as having been fulfilled in the past, that this is already done. Now let's begin with, first of all, by just surveying uh, just briefly how it is that certain people see this as primarily future. And I think that those who do fall into a camp that I've mentioned a num you know, numerous times, the reason why I bring it up so many times is because I used to be in that camp. And I went to a college that taught this. And so I was really heavily indoctrinated into this. And before I went to that college, I was in churches that believed this which is the reason why I went to a college that believed this. But it was at that college that they actually talked me out of it as they were trying to prove that it was true. But dispensationalism sees Jesus here speaking primarily of the future from our perspective, not just the disciples, but also from us. That he's speaking of this tribulation period, the seven years that follow Christ's return for his church. Jesus, in their estimation, will return. He'll rapture the church out of the world. He'll raise all the dead believers. And then he will turn for judgment upon the earth for seven years. First half being the tribulation. The second half being the great tribulation. During the first half, they believe that an antichrist is going to be raised up that he's going to make some kind of a treaty or a pact that's going to allow the Jews to rebuild their temple in its original location, because that's where it has to be, and they're going to reestablish their sacrificial system. But at the start of the second half, called the Great Tribulation, the Antichrist is basically going to desecrate the temple with what's called the abomination of desolation, that we, you know, again, we read about that in, in Mark 13. And that's going to usher in the Great Tribulation. And then after this, the Lord will destroy the Antichrist. He will destroy his enemies by his second coming. And then at the same time, rescue his people Israel. Judge them and all the living of all the nations who survive. And those who are worthy will go into the millennium. Basically a thousand years of peace and prosperity on the earth. Now this is what they believe Jesus was telling his disciples was going to happen in the distant future at least 2,000 years from then, because what we're in, what, 2013, and it still hasn't taken place. They believe that that's what Jesus was referring to 
in Mark 13. Now, the next group sees Jesus speaking about what was both past and what is still future. They realize that he was speaking about the temple that existed then, that that temple would be destroyed, and what the circumstances would be that would lead up to its destruction. But they also believe that because the judgment that God brings upon Israel in the destruction of the temple is so similar to what things are going to be like when the Lord Jesus returns again, that at some point in the text, he begins to speak about that future event. Plus, they see, of course, the, what looks to be like a reference to, the, to Jesus Christ coming again. And they, says, they say, this has to be the second coming. So at some point in this narrative that Jesus gives, in this explanation, he shades off into the future and begins talking about the second coming. Now, one of the reasons, another reason why they believe that is because in Matthew's gospel, in chapter 25, clearly the Lord at some point begins to talk about the final judgment and about the second coming. So that's why they believe that, that somewhere in here there is that transition. And I have to say that most people in the reform camp today see this text in this way. But there is one other view at least one other view, I'm sure there's plenty of others, but at least one other view. And that is the view that Jesus here is speaking primarily about the judgment that he was going to bring upon Israel in 70 AD. In other words, he is speaking about something that has happened in the past from our perspective. Future from their perspective, it's prophecy, but past from ours because it's already been fulfilled. Now, certainly, Jesus in this text does make some reference to what is going on right now with regard to the gathering of his elect from the four corners of the earth, from everywhere under heaven. That, I believe, is going on right now. That's not yet completed. But the bulk of what he is speaking about here has to do with what Jesus said he was about to do to Israel not too far in their future, that is, in 70 A.D. Now, let's look at a couple of things in this passage that should lead us to that very conclusion. Yeah, this is one of the things I think is helpful to do to see what it is that Jesus is speaking about before we attempt to try to understand all the nuts and bolts, all the different images that are here, all the different statements. Let's try to figure out who the audience is so that we can understand it from their perspective and what it is they were hearing, rather than seeing this as something addressed to 21st century Christians and what we should expect to be seeing. Remember, there was an original audience to this. So first of all, let's consider the context in which Jesus is actually saying these things. Mark begins with Jesus leaving the temple. And as he was going out, one of the disciples said to him, teacher, Behold, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. I mean, I understand it was, it was magnificent and the stones were huge. And the fact that, that in those days something like that could be built was a marvel in and of itself. Jesus said, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. Now, not wanting to remain in the dark, and with Jesus being in your company, you really don't have to. Peter, James, John, and Andrew came to him and asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? Now notice, when will these things be? That's the question. Well, what things are they asking about? the things that Jesus had just talked to them about, the buildings that he had pointed out to them earlier, the temple, and these surrounding buildings. When are these things going to be torn down? That not one stone would be left standing upon another. They wanted to know when that was going to take place. That is their question. Now, naturally, we would expect Jesus to answer that question. Wouldn't you expect that? Not a question about a temple 
that's going to be rebuilt sometime in the future over 2,000 years from their perspective that the Antichrist would allow them to rebuild? That's not the question they were asking. They had no idea about any such temple. Neither was Jesus speaking about any such temple. He was talking about that temple because that was the question they asked. Now that seems clear enough. Notice their second question. What will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? Now again, all what things? The things that have to do with the demolition of that particular temple. How will we know when this temple is going to be destroyed? And again, in answering this question, would we expect Jesus to speak about a temple that was going to be built in the future and the signs of when that temple was going to be destroyed? No. And yet, that is what I was taught for many years in the churches I attended. That was what I was taught in the college that I attended. Jesus was not speaking about that temple. He was speaking about a temple that was going to be built 2,000 years in the future. By the way, it still hasn't been <laughs> built. Jesus would not speak about that temple because that wasn't the question. And we don't even know that such a temple is even going to be built. But he would be speaking about the events that would lead up to the destruction of the temple that they were actually asking him about. Now again, I would, you probably think this is much ado about nothing or laboring over something that uh, seems so obvious, but to many people it is not obvious. You wouldn't believe how many people think that Jesus was speaking about events that are still future from our perspective. But that's not what he's talking about. He says absolutely nothing about that. He's talking about the destruction of that temple, which, as a matter of fact, took place in 70 AD, 40 years in the future from the time that Jesus actually said this. Now, really, the context alone should be enough to tell us that that is what Jesus was speaking about and it wouldn't leave us with any doubt. But there are other things that show us that that, as a matter of fact, is what Jesus was talking about. Consider, for instance, his audience. To whom is Jesus actually speaking? And what is he speaking to them about? Well, let's look at a few samples here. Um, and here we'll go through rapidly. Maybe this would be a good place to have your Bibles open uh, to Mark 13. If not, listen to what he says in verse 5. He says, see to it that no one misleads you. Well, he was he, to whom is he referring there? To the disciples. Verse 7, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. These things must take place, but that is not yet the end. When you hear of these things. Verse 9, be on your guard, for they will deliver you to the courts, and you will be flogged in the synagogues. And you will stand before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them. Who was he speaking to? To the disciples. Verse 11, when they arrest you and hand you over, do not, be, or do not worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but it is the Holy Spirit. Again, to whom was Jesus speaking? Verse 13, you will be hated by all because of my name, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Now, is the you Jesus is speaking to here a group of believers? Is he speaking to us 2,000 years in the future from his perspective? Or is he speaking to the disciples that were living and were present there who were asking him questions about when are these things going to happen and what are the signs that they're going to happen? Well, Jesus says these things are going to happen, but that's not yet the end. These things are going to happen to you. And what about what Jesus says when the events actually take place? Now, this is something that's very important. Is Jesus shading into the future now? Is he talking about things that are going to happen in our generation? Are these things we should be looking for? Who does he speak to about these events here? And what does he say to them? Look at verse 14. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be. Let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. He says in verse 18, but pray 
that it may not happen in the winter. Now, you is understood here. You pray that it not happen at this time because this will make it difficult for you to flee to the mountains. Again, Jesus is speaking to them. Verse 21, but then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or behold, he is there, do not believe him. Well, Jesus is warning his disciples because this is an event that would impact their lives. He's not warning you know, disciples that are living 2,000 years later. And then what about the warnings that he gives that follows all of this based upon what he has said? These are the things that are going to lead up to it. This is the event itself. This is what you need to do. But then he, he gives them a series of warnings based upon what he's just said. Verse 23. But take heed, behold, I have told you everything in advance. Verses 28 and 29. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near, right at the door. And then I believe verses 35 through 37, therefore be on the alert for you do not know when your master or when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening at midnight or when the rooster crows in the morning, in case he should some come uh, suddenly and find you asleep, what I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. Now some take this to mean that um, Jesus is coming. And by the way, I don't, re I don't believe Jesus here is referring to the second coming. And that when he says you'll see the sign of the Son of Man coming in the clouds and so forth, that is what compels so many people to take this as future. I don't think he's referring to that. But those who do believe he warned the disciples Jesus could come at any minute. And for each successive generation of Christians who live, he could come at any minute. Make sure you're on the alert at all times because he could come at any time. And his coming for us then 2,000 years later is even more imminent because all this time has passed and he still hasn't come. And yet his coming was supposed to be near. Actually, some liberals have looked at that and said the Bible can't be true. Because Jesus said his coming was near, it's 2,000 years, and he still hasn't come. But that's not what he was talking about. We're going to look at what he was talking about in future sermons. What he was referring to was his coming in judgment against Israel. The stone falls upon them and grinds them into powder, as it were. And there is plenty of evidence from the Old Testament from this imagery that he uses to prove that this was not meant to show that Jesus was going to come bodily but that he was going to come in judgment against them for their sins in some other way. He was going to overthrow that nation. He was going to bring judgment upon them. But again, Jesus tells them, look for these warning signs. And then when it happens, this is what you're supposed to do. And on the basis of that, he says, take heed then, be on your guard. It could happen at any time. And you need to be ready because you don't know the day or the hour Jesus is not speaking to a generation of Christians living far in the future. He is speaking to his disciples who lived then regarding an event that was going to take place during their lifetime. Now again, unless Jesus expected them to live a very long time, you know, for an event that hasn't taken place 2,000 years later, he had to be speaking to them. Now there is one more detail that I think clearly shows that Jesus is not intending to speak about an event that was way in the future, but one that was near to them. He gives us a time frame for when this is actually going to take place. And he gives it to us in verse 30. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, what about what do the people do who think that, that this is referring to the second coming and that this is something that's still future with regard to us? What do they do with a statement like that? Well, what they believe is that the word generation there means race or ethnic group of individuals and that the Jews as a distinct people group would not vanish from the earth until all these things take place because after all, these things are meant primarily for Israel. So it, the idea is that Israel will not pass away. The Jews will not vanish as a race of people on the earth 
until this takes place. But is that what Jesus actually meant? Was he saying that? Or was he saying that the generation that was living then, which is a matter of fact what the word actually means, would not die until all the things that I have just told you about actually take place? Now, Jesus did, as a matter of fact, speak this in 30 A.D. And that generation of Jews that was living in 30 A.D., for the most part, was still living in 70 A.D. when these things actually took place. Now, to further that point, realize that this generation that Jesus is referring to is the same generation that we just read about in, in Matthew 23, that Jesus said he was charging all the righteous blood shed on earth to. They were the ones who rejected him. They were the ones Jesus was weeping over because of what was coming upon them. But it was to that generation that the death of all the righteous would be charged. Again, Matthew 23, 34 through 36, and again, consider what happens in the book of Acts because I believe this is what Jesus is referring to. Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Jesus, I believe, was speaking about those who were living in his day because they were the ones who committed the crimes that he's referring to and who would commit the crimes that he describes in these passages. Again, read the book of Acts, and you'll see how the Jews treated Jesus' people, his disciples. So Jesus was speaking about the temple that the disciples were pointing to and asking him about. That was going to be destroyed, not one stone be left upon another in 70 A.D. It was judgment on that generation for their rejection of him. He was then warning that generation of what was going to happen to them. This event is not future for us, though it was for them 40 years in the future. It is past for us. Well, now, the fact that it's past, does that mean it's irrelevant to us? See, that's the next question. Well, no more than any other part of the Bible that's been fulfilled. Is the fact that Jesus Christ was crucified irrelevant? No. This isn't either. Okay? There is still a lesson for us to learn from this, actually several of them. The first thing I think we can learn from this is the fact that the Lord is true to his word. When he says something is going to happen, that thing happens. Jesus said that generation would not pass away until all these things were fulfilled. All those things were fulfilled before that generation passed away. As a matter of fact, the majority of that generation passed away when it was fulfilled. A lot of Jews died in that judgment. It also proves that Jesus is who he said he was because who can tell the future but only God who has planned the future. Remember, prophecy is one of the ways that a messenger of the Lord is vindicated, uh, as, is verified as being a messenger from the Lord in that he tells what's going to happen in the future and that happens. Well, Jesus did. Of course, Jesus tells us he is the Messiah and this proves that he is. But it also reminds us, I believe most of all, of what happens to those who reject Messiah. A.D. 70 was the worst thing that has ever happened to any group of people that has ever lived. Jesus said uh, that nothing worse would ever happen. And actually, nothing worse ever has, although some bad things have happened. The Holocaust was a horrible thing. But what happened to these people in 70 A.D. was even worse than that. Now, the reason why the judgment was so severe was because of the privileges that the Jews actually had. They had so much knowledge. They had so many privileges. They had the scriptures for all those years pointing to the Messiah, who he would be when he, when he would come, what he would do when he would come. And when Messiah actually comes, they hate him, they reject him, they crucify him. 
They have all this, all this blessing, and yet they reject Jesus Christ, and so what comes upon them is extremely severe. Now, what about us? What do we have beyond what they had? Do you realize that we have more than what they had? Uh, they had the Old Testament scriptures. They had the prophecies. They had the types and the shadows. They had the promises. We have that too in our Old Testament, by the way. We have what they have, but we have something more than what they have. We have the New Testament. We have an explanation of the fulfillment of all these things. We have eyewitness accounts that are inspired. We, we have much more than they had. Now, what if we reject it? What if we turn away from it? What's going to happen to us? Now, you need to realize that the Lord has given this to you, and for the same reason, he gave it what he did to the Jews. Remember how Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who stones the prophets, kills those that are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks or her brood under her wings, and you were unwilling. The Lord doesn't give you his gospel to condemn you. He doesn't do this to destroy you. He didn't do those things for Israel to destroy them. Jesus didn't come into the city pronouncing judgment, but salvation. It was a great blessing to have Messiah in your midst and to declare the grace of God and how you could be reconciled to him. That was a wonderful blessing. The problem is in their rejection. It's not in what Jesus Christ did. So I don't want you to think that this is a bad thing to have the gospel. It's not a bad thing. It's a very good thing. The Lord has blessed us tremendously. But it is a terrible thing to reject that kindness and turn away from that mercy. If you do, judgment will be severe, much more severe than for the person who never hears, you see. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 10:15 that it would be much more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment, which we hold up and as, as held up in the scriptures as you know, the example of God's judgment because God rained down fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed those cities because of their evil. It's going to be more tolerable for them in the day of judgment than for those who have heard the gospel and rejected it. And why is that? Because those who hear the gospel have a tremendous privilege. Those in Sodom and Gomorrah died in darkness. They did not hear the gospel. It was never offered to them. We have much more light than they did. And so to reject that is a much more severe crime in God's eyes. So what is the point behind this? God offers you his grace and his mercy in the gospel. Don't take that, you know, don't take that for granted. That's one thing that, that is a danger, uh, sadly, we, a danger within the church when we, our children hear this every day of their lives growing up in the church, and after a while they don't hear it anymore because they've heard it so many times, right? And so you take it for granted that that offer is always there, that knowledge is always there, and the more you don't do something with it, the more it becomes irrelevant to you. Don't let the gospel become irrelevant to you. It is an offer of infinite value. But you are not saved by having the offer. You are saved by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the evidence that you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ is that you turn from your sins and you begin to do all that he calls you to do. Now, we all fail in many different ways, but we try to do it because that is now what is in our hearts. We love the Lord. If we truly are trusting in Jesus Christ, we love him, and we want to do what he calls us to do. And when we don't do it, it grieves us. So what do you do with his gospel? You trust the one who is offered to you in the gospel. Trust him to save you. Trust him alone. And at the same time, you, you will automatically turn from your sins and you will begin to follow him. It will be difficult. It's not easy. We still have our flesh to wrestle with. 
but we will not allow our flesh to control us any longer. Its power will be broken, and we will walk in the ways of the Lord. And so as I told the graduates yesterday as well, if you truly want to receive the blessings that are in the gospel, you must not only trust Jesus Christ, but you must follow him your whole life, give him your whole life, use all the Lord gives you to serve him and honor him, and the Lord will bless you in this life, even though there will be persecutions. He will bless you, and you will be blessed in that world which is to come. And to be blessed there is much more important than being blessed here. I mean, you can have, as the health and wealth guys say, they, you know, God wants you to be rich. Well, he doesn't want you to be rich, but if you, even if you were, even if you possess the whole world, it means nothing. Jesus said you can have the whole world and lose your own soul. What good is that? No good at all. Because you only are, are then happy for some 80 years, if you live to be 80 or 90 or 100 at the most, I mean, that's going way to the outside. But eternity is a whole lot longer than that. And what really matters is, is who prospers in eternity, not who prospers in this life. So use what the Lord has given to you in this life in serving him. That's a part of the blessing of the gospel, is you know that's coming, you know that's what life is all about, and so that is where you're going to aim your life. So don't go for the world. The world's going to perish, and those who are of the world are going to perish with the world. But those who forsake the world to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, those are the ones who are not only going to be blessed here, but blessed in the life which is to come that goes on forever. May the Lord give us grace to listen to the warning here. Even though it may not be meant for us literally, there is a judgment coming that does apply to us, and we need to be ready for it. And the way that you're ready for it is trust Jesus, turn from your sins, follow him, serve him, love him with your whole life, and then you will be ready. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of, of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard to us as individuals.